Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's both an honor and also a privilege for me to be able to stand before you today to share this moment. Perhaps I should begin by saying a very big thank you to Susan and our team for putting this wonderful event together. Uh, on behalf of myself, my daughter and my wife are standing there I say big thank you to you for your dedication, for your tenacity, and for your creativity. And to you, the audience, it gives me pleasure to see so many bright faces here today. Your mere presence here, to me, affirms your commitment to the well-being of persons with Alzheimer's disease, as well as their family. I felt as though after such an eloquent uh, comments by Susan, I feel like I should just come here and say thank you and then go and sit down. <laughs> but she insisted that I have to say a few words. The word itself, reason for hope, in my view, exemplifies the creativity of the Alzheimer's Association. It sums up almost 100 years of hard work that went into getting us to where we are today with respect to scientific advancement on Alzheimer's disease. Even the choice of today is equally intriguing. As many of you may be well aware, it was exactly today, April the 16th, in 1789, where George Washington headed for the presidential inauguration. And even of more relevance to the reason why we are here today is that of Jesse Neyman, the first African-American woman to obtain a PhD in chemistry. A bad day was exactly today in 1921. What an impressive and interesting day. It marks the beginning of many, many good things to come in our fight against Alzheimer's disease. I'm sure many of you may be asking, why did you get involved in Alzheimer's disease research? Well, for me, this is a three-legged story. Because of personal involvement in the care of persons with Alzheimer's disease, my own mother-in-law suffered from Alzheimer's disease at the twilight of her life. My wife and I have the scars to show for it, but more so for my wife. We saw the devastation caused by Alzheimer's disease firsthand. So when I tell family members, I understand your feelings, I understand what you're going through, little do many of them know that I truly have the scar to show for it. As a geriatrician and a clinician, 99% of my patient population are persons experiencing memory decline. So often, I see the palpable fear on their faces when giving the news about what is to come. This is a very, very devastating disease. And from a scientific standpoint, I'm glad to be able to use my own personal experience in cardiovascular disease research to inform scientific advancement in Alzheimer's disease. This I'm going to come back to somewhat later. But there are very promising opportunities in our fight against Alzheimer's disease, and I'm sure that's all why you are here. That's all you want to hear today. For almost 100 years, since Dr. Alzheimer's described the case of a 57-year-old woman called Augusta, research on Alzheimer's disease moved at a very, very slow speed. Almost what I described at a snail speed. About 10 years ago, through the coordinated effort of the National Institute on Aging, the Alzheimer's Association, and many private organizations. 
The Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative study was conceived and done. It's the most monumental study of our time. Little do many people know that the definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is made at autopsy. That is the fact. When we say somebody has Alzheimer's disease, we say you have presumable, you are presumed to have Alzheimer's disease. Possible Alzheimer's disease, probable that Alzheimer's disease. The only way we could make the definitive diagnosis is when somebody dies and you take a sample of the brain and you send it to the lab, you look at it under the microscope and you say, yes, it's there. It's Alzheimer's disease. What a tragedy. The person is already dead. That's really an inefficient way to make a diagnosis of a disease. Fortunately for us, over the 10 years, science and Alzheimer's disease has really moved at an alarming pace, incredibly fast pace. We go to the uh, yearly scientific conference, the International Congress on Alzheimer's Disease, everybody looking for the great news, where often we do get the great news. But to go back to the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, Instead of making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease when somebody dies, we are now closer than ever to making the diagnosis, the definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in someone who's alive. If you have a urinary tract infection today, you go to your doctor. Your doctor takes a urine sample, sends it to the lab, Identify the bug and then determine which antibiotics is sensitive to and prescribe you an antibiotics. If you don't know the enemy for Alzheimer's disease, how can you attack the disease? But as a result of the Alzheimer's disease in Romeo initiative and many, many wonderful work going on around the country and around the world, we are now able to take a sample of fluid from your spinal space as well as from blood and identify the offending protein that is causing this cause of a disease. Not only are we able to identify that protein in the blood sample in the spinal space, we can actually see the deposition of the protein in the brain of a living person real time. So science and creativity and technology are all converging together to make it possible for us to actually attend the offend to, uh, to identify the offending protein in somebody who is living and also be able to look at the brain real time and follow the progression of the disease. This is a monumental, monumental achievement because we are now at stages where we are actually developing drugs that target this protein. From my own personal research, much of which I'm unable to disclose to you this morning because of embargo, some of this what we're going to be presenting in Boston. There is increasing evidence that cardiovascular disease risk may in fact promote the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So if you have elevated cholesterol, if you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, my message to you is you must get them under control. If there's evidence of depression, you must get it taken care of. This is not 1900, this is year 2000 and beyond. This is 2013. You can do something about these risk factors. But important obstacles to research remain. One of the most important obstacles it's resources. I know there are so many competing needs, but without adequate resource, we cannot take the important discoveries that we've made in the past 10 years and get it to you. In order for it to get to you, clinical trials must be conducted. That is the only way it can happen. And without resources, it's impossible to make that happen. We must garner support because we need political will in order to make this happen. 
perhaps you must also recognize that the brain is a very, very complex organ with billions and billions and billions of neurons and thousands and thousands of different chemicals all firing at different rates. This made the challenge that we are facing a little bit more daunting. I'd like to close my comments by telling you, by sharing with you how you can be involved. But before I get to that, I think I'd like to share with you why I think you should be involved. Earlier on, Susan mentioned the word bond. I didn't even know that that was going to come up in her speech. Bond, the word bond. Can we connect that to memory? Memory is what we're talking about. Memory is what connects the past with the present and allows you to imagine the future. Memory is what binds families together, is what is the connection between husband and wife, between siblings, between neighbors, among your sorority. Without memory, our time on this earth will be meaningless because it is the essence of our being. It allows us to imagine, and it's the only reason we've been successful as part of the animal kingdom. Without memory, we will be nothing. Now, how can you get involved? There is room for everybody. Everybody has a role to play. If you are blessed to be financially servant, you can support with your resources. You can support the Osamas Association. As Susan said earlier on, the Osamas Association is the largest supporter, funder of research. You can donate your time as a caregiver. You can volunteer. You can volunteer for research. You can encourage others to volunteer if you are unable to volunteer. It's very important that we all get involved. We cannot stand by and be expecting somebody else to do it. It will not get done. My involvement in such Simon's disease research is just for me to say I played my part. I was here and did something about it. Thank you for your attention.